So as you watch this, I'm either just about to go on holiday or I've just come back. So life has been pretty hectic and busy. I thought I'd try and squeeze in a quick video here so that I could upload you with something and not leave you hanging whilst I was away. So today I wanted to discuss the difference between isolation exercises, compound exercises and calisthenics and specifically which ones are the best in terms of functional strength, aesthetics, etc. Because a lot of people have some very strong opinions on these matters and you might find that there's some information you're not aware of that could help you to reassess those opinions. <music> So the conventional view that a lot of people take is that compound exercises are more effective than isolation exercises. Compound exercises being multi-joint exercises, so that includes things like the squat, like the bench press, the deadlift, clean and snatch, anything where you're using multiple muscles at once in unison. So this requires coordination, it requires the muscles to work as a single unit, and that is how you use them in the real world. If you're pushing furniture around, if you're pulling down a of something. I don't know what you pull down in the real world, that was a weird example. But if you're essentially using your strength in the real world, you don't just use one joint, as in isolation exercises. Isolation exercises are your bicep curls, your tricep extensions, your lat pull downs. Here, you are fixed into place, lat pull downs less so. You're fixed into place and you're using just one or perhaps two joints, and that really isolates all the focus onto one muscle. But that is not how you use your muscles in the real world. So yes, like I say, a lot of people these days in particular prefer compound exercises because they think they're more functional. They think they are closer to how you'd move in the real world. Exemplifying this, you have your seven primal movements. This is the notion that there are seven basic movements on top of which all other movements can be built. So these are gait, which is walking and running, lunging, squatting, bending, torque, pushing, which includes vertical push and horizontal push, pulling, which is vertical pull and horizontal pull. Notice that bicep curls are not on that list. So in other words, these are the movements that everyone should be able to do, that we would have been able to do in the wild and that we would have used a lot during our evolution, and thus they are the most functional, the most useful. And all of these compound movements involve piling lots of weight on top and then doing those movements. So squat is of course, squatting, you can do a lunge, you can do gait with something like farmer's walk, you can do uh, torque with this uh, axe exercise using the cable pulley machine, you get the idea. And a lot of people will also tell you that compound movements are what you need to use if you want to get bigger. And the reason they cite for this is that using multiple muscle groups in unison triggers the release of more anabolic hormones like testosterone, like growth hormone. This has been shown in studies that you do release more of these hormones during exercises of that, that nature, and in theory it follows that you would build more muscle as a result. Thus, many people say that the most important thing you can do if you want to become a big bodybuilder type is to do squats and deadlifts, etc. And then you have all those crossfitters like Rich Froning who appear to support this theory. Thus, the isolation exercise, the traditional movements used by a lot of bodybuilders, the isolation curl, the tricep kickback, etc. These are going the way of the dodo, the leg extension, the hamstring curls. People are saying that these exercises aren't functional, they're likely to cause injury, imbalances, and that they don't build as much muscle. But the first thing I want to do is to defend the isolation movement, because I think that there's a lot of merit in isolation movement, and it's actually something that everyone should be doing as a part of their routine, whether or not you are interested in functional strength, whether or not you're interested in looking great. First of all, if you want to create micro tears and metabolic stress, which are the things you need in order to create hypertrophy, muscle growth in any specific area, then you do need isolation exercises. So there are lots of theories as to how hypertrophy works, but generally the concept is that the more you curl when you're lifting a heavy enough weight, you create tiny tears in the muscle fiber called micro tears. These then heal with satellite cells, come back thicker and stronger, the muscle gets bigger. At the same time, the muscle is also pumped with more fluids, it stores more fluids as you train for endurance in those exercises. When you do an isolation exercise, such as a curl, you're focusing just on that muscle and this really isolates it. It focuses all of those micro tears and all of that metabolic stress 
on that muscle. When you do a exercise like a squat or a bench press, you're using so many different muscles at once that they're not focused, you're not focusing all the effort on just one. But more importantly, when you're doing an isolation exercise, you can go to failure and you can go beyond failure. So you can do as many bicep curls as you can physically do, then give up, then lower the weight and do a drop set, continue to go. And what this does is it creates those micro tears, you pick up the lighter weight, you create even more micro tears. Meanwhile, you're swelling the area with blood, which is what's causing the metabolic stress. You're occluding it, you're preventing the blood from escaping. That's what gives you that sensation of pump. The greatest feeling you can get in a gym or the most satisfying feeling you can get in the gym is the pump. Let's say you drain your biceps, blood is rushing into your muscles and that's what we call the pump. Your muscles get a really tight feeling, like your skin is going to explode any minute. You know, it's really tight. It's like somebody blowing air into, into your muscle. It just blows up and it feels different. It, it feels fantastic. And then you're essentially just really nuking that muscle. And you just can't do that with a multi-joint exercise. The reason being that if you're doing a squat and you start to suffer, if one muscle starts to become weaker than the others, then you have to stop. If you're squatting, and your hamstrings aren't as strong as, say, your back, or if your um, glutes aren't as strong, then you'll have to put down the weight. You won't be able to complete the repetition, but none of them will have gone to failure. It's also not safe to keep going through drop sets and to aim for your one rep max without a spotter. So you just can't create the same kind of isolated damage to the muscle that you need in order to trigger massive growth. You have to stop before you get to that point. And as for the body producing more anabolic hormones during these exercises, that actually doesn't have as much as a bearing as you might think. Studies show that the testosterone and the growth hormone that you produce during these big compound lifts and any exercise don't actually contribute to hypertrophy. So it is true that you produce more when you do the compound lifts, but it doesn't make any difference anyways. You know when you watch an action film or when you have sex or when you see someone win a race, these are also things that trigger testosterone release in the body, but none of those things are gonna help you to build muscle. It's a quick spike. It doesn't affect your um, regular levels of testosterone and thus it doesn't affect anabolism. So the whole notion that you have to do these big lifts in order to create more hormonal response in order to get bigger is incorrect. And let's not forget that muscle endurance in itself is also functional. It's all very good and well being able to lift something really heavy once with a big compound lift, but in many ways, it's actually more useful more of the time in the real world to be able to lift something quite heavy lots of times, such as whether you're carrying heavy bags home from Tesco or whether you're wrestling somebody. <laughs> Bodybuilding using isolation exercises for larger rep ranges uh, causes sarcoplasmic hypertrophy, fills up the cytoplasm um, inside the muscle cells and this gives you more endurance. It allows you to pump out more reps. Or the shorter version, if it was good enough for Arnie, then it's good enough for us. The great thing about the compound moves is you'll be building up those small supporting muscles that get missed with isolation because nobody does, you know, an isolation day for their brachialis or for their serratus muscles. So I'm not telling you not to do compound movements. Like I say, they are more functional. They are closer to what we would do, you know, in the wild during our evolution. But I'm also saying don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Isolation movements are still very important, especially if you're interested in hypertrophy and size. And if you're interested in building pure strength, then they're important as well, because of course you're strengthening the, the links in that chain and isolating the muscles that are the primary movers. At the same time, you can bring up areas that are perhaps lagging behind. You can focus on specific weaknesses in your form and your physique. So there's a lot of reason to kind of spot focus on a specific muscle, whether you're interested in performance or aesthetics. So the best way to combine these different types of training is by doing the compound movements at the start of the workout whilst you've got full strength. And that'll also get you a little bit of a pre-burn on the muscles. And then you can focus on specific areas following that. And this lends itself particularly well to a push-pull leg split, which is my preferred split. But of course, there are lots of different ways you can manage this. The other thing I want to address is that even compound movements aren't quite as functional as many people would assume. They are very functional, um, but they're still practicing a very specific movement under very ideal circumstances. So what you're doing when you do a deadlift is you're squatting down to the weight, you're picking it up off the floor, you're standing up, and people say, this teaches you to get better at picking things up. What it really teaches you to get better at though is picking up bars 
from a stationary position on a flat floor. Uh, in real world, whether you're helping someone move house or doing anything else, you're gonna be picking up weights that are a different shape, you're gonna be moving backwards whilst carrying them, you're gonna be carrying them downstairs, and in the wild you just plain wouldn't have ever done a deadlift. You wouldn't really have that much need to pick up anything heavy. If you did, it would probably be a rock, you'd probably be standing on uneven ground, your grip would be all over the place. So really, if you're training a very specific technique, that's not terribly functional. And if you're saying you need to get that technique perfectly right, otherwise you're gonna injure yourself, then that's not terribly functional because again, in the wild, you need to be prepared for every different scenario. You need to be prepared for differences in the level of the ground, differences in the shape of what you're lifting. If you look at an animal, an animal doesn't warm up before it goes running. It doesn't need to use correct form. It just instinctively runs, it jumps, it fights, it lifts if it's a gorilla, but probably still nothing that heavy. And it does all this without thinking, without using correct technique. It's just so strong that it can handle all these different things. And in my recent video on old time strongmen, I talked about how they did the anyhow lift and all these different moves that had them moving away from the weight or lifting unusual shapes. And doing these things is a great way to build a kind of a much more functional strength. At the same time, calisthenics is very good for this because when you do calisthenics, a, you're using your body as it's meant to be used. In the wild, like I said, you wouldn't really have picked up things, but what you would have done is climbed trees, jumped over ravines, um, swam, done uh, mounts as you climbed mountains. You'd have done press-up type stuff, I guess. All these types of movements are real movements, and they, again, are very compound. They're very natural. They use all of your muscles in conjunction and to an even greater extent in many ways than a lot of the compound lifts. You try doing a plank, or a handstand press up, you're using your entire core, you're controlling, you're aware of your whole body. This is an incredibly um, functional type of training. When you climb a tree, you have to not only pull yourself up, but you're grabbing different widths of branches, you're clinging on at different levels, you're pulling using completely different combination of muscles on every single repetition. And that's what true functional strength is. It's adaptability, it's being able to adapt to your surroundings and not have to use a specific form, not being able to say, I can't use my strength in this context. So if you wanna be as functional as possible, you need a rounded kind of strength. And that's actually why it's best to use all three types of training in your workouts to focus on those specific muscles and build up the strength to build those weaknesses you have in your body, to learn correct technique for complicated compound movements, to build mind-muscle connection, and to be able to adapt to different situations, to use your body the way it was designed to be used. So those people who prefer one type of training to another, that's perfectly fine, but don't bemoan the others. Don't say that one is better than the other objectively because they all have their place. And if you want the greatest strength, you should combine all three together in a well-designed training program. So that was just a little bit of a rant. Hope you found it somewhat interesting. There's a lot more I have to say on this topic that just slipped my mind. Like I say, this is just a quick video I wanted to sneak in before I went away. Uh, perhaps it takes me a while to edit it and you're seeing it after I get back. <laughs> Either way, let me know what you think in the comments. Um, I've done two on fitness and muscle building recently because the last one was quite a hit, but I'm gonna be covering some more topics in future videos, including brain training. I want to do another video on nootropics. I'll be discussing that GPD pocket. I want to get some footage of using it abroad because that's really part of the appeal of it. So yeah, if you'd like to see that, then stay tuned. Please consider liking and sharing this video. It really helps me out. Like I say, the channel's getting some momentum. I'm super excited about that. Head over and follow me on Twitter, Facebook, etc. I'd love to see you there. And just thanks a ton for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye for now.